was maybe while I was going to UCLA like, getting my graduate degree and all right afterwards. Okay. You know, I have to really look I mean, the time is getting like a little bit fuzzy. Mm -hmm. So so Nella hires you yes. to work there yes. in the education department. Right. Which is one of these basic after, type of deals. After college. Yeah. Okay. So she's still there at that time. Oh yes. Because I assume that she was kicked out. In sixty nine is what she said was that she left. But she left in 69, yeah, so, and, you, you and I didn't get there until 70. She must be wrong about that date. Well, that could be. Okay. Yeah. But you were definitely hired by her. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She was there when I was first there, and then her job was taken over by other people, and I worked for those other people. And actually, in that job is where I met Adam Avila, who took all of these pho wonderful photographs yes. that really, you know, allow me to have uh, a career that has history because his photographs were so wonderful. He worked in the children's art workshop with me teaching children photography, but he also worked in the photography department at LACMA as their, um, you know, in their documentary program. For years, he just retired a couple of years. And he took all the pictures and showed Um, do you want to have one last comment and then, because uh, we can break now, okay. right on time. Um, I'd like minutes. to have one mm -hmm. last comment. I'm sorry? I'd like, uh, do you want yeah, to Yeah, no, no, last okay. comments. Last comments. Okay. Anybody, okay. last comments. Okay, all right. This is a long last comment that has okay. lots of different oh, I'm things. Oh, I'm sorry, I was thinking you forgot to bring it. Oh, is that wrong? Um, I, um, very quickly, because it reminded me when Marin was mentioning something about, or Ulysses, somebody was mentioning something about um, their, why they got into it, and I couldn't remember, and now I remember. Uh, there's, a, there's a restaurant, it was a buffet restaurant in Los Angeles called Clifton's, um, yeah. downtown LA. And Clifton's was a very interesting place because it was always, um, uh, a preacher outside ranting and raving. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah I remember that part. But yeah, I remember the chicken. Yeah, there's always a <laughs> preacher with a, you know, the world is coming to an end or whatever. And so inside uh, Clifton's, I don't know, but the owner, you know, had a little religious thing going on. So it was like an environment because there were like little artificial caves and stuff that never so, went. Drippy fountains. Yes, drippy fountains. <laughs> all, all, all. Larry, you mentioned this. They had an interview okay. with their guy on, okay. on the radio mm -hmm. on uh, KPPC here, mm -hmm. uh, talking about how he was trying to create these visions of other other worlds and other cultures. So mm -hmm. he was trying to, in his way, do his whole kind of universal right. kind of concept inside right. when you walk inside of. Uh, and and that was it. And I mean, I was really taken by it. And I was a little kid, and I love foods. So I mean, that's the perfect combination. It's <laughs> this environment and food. And I went into the basement, which was like the catacombs. And there's this big Jesus, huge Jesus, in the middle before you could get to the bathroom. <laughs> and I remember sitting on Jesus's lap and just thinking, this is wonderful. To, you know, it was a sculpture event. Mm -hmm. And for me to be able to interact with a sculpture was so significant. And then to see all these other things around, you know, I mean, that was hitting my head and my heart and everything, this issue of environment. Well, and and Clifton's was before Disneyland. Yes. <laughs> I mean, as yeah. far as that, yeah. that sort of thematic kind of thing. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, now this photograph <laughs> was done by Barbara McCullough in her living room. And uh, oh this God. is the photograph that we use for dance card, which uh, was a collaboration in uh, Santa with Barbara. Mar with Marin. With Marin and Mar Ulysses and, and Parker. Right. And, um... Matter of fact, hold that up some so I get because this is Frank Parker, yeah. who's very, who's oh, very uh, much a part of what we were in doing. Totally, totally. He was wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, But you wonderful. Need, to, need to read what it is, so it's oh. Dance Card, uh, what is that, a nappy performance? Uh, yeah, persuasion? Dance Card, a nappy perfor uh, performance of Tangled Pursuit. <laughs> and I would call Barbara and ask me, Barbara, 
because she's the wordsmith. I said, Barbara, I need some words. And she would work it and work it and work it, and then you know we would come so up funny. with these phrases. So um, yeah, so this is you know she was talking about her. Well, you know, in my thing, I found I had this postcard you sent me. Mm -hmm. That also was a part of that when we were rehearsing. Right. With me and Barbara dancing. Right, and, oh, right, 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 right. And Frank waiting his turn right. to cut in. <laughs> and I wrote, just wrote about that thing just the other night because I'm trying to put it on my website. And it's just so cool, you know, the whole notion of uh, slow dance, which is, you know, mm -hmm. a high art form exactly. in the black community exactly. in our culture. And. <laughs> And they all, well, can I cut in on you, brother? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, Sanka directed that so beautifully that uh, I had no idea what it looked like at all. I was just doing what she said to do. Mm -hmm. And then when later, when they videotaped it and I looked at it, I couldn't believe how gorgeous it was. I still can't believe and it. And Ulysses was so funny. It I mean, so, he was just hysterical. So People were just cracking up. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, when we start the new thing, the new, the next, Segment, I really want to show this video. Okay, good. Yeah, yes. well, let's, you know, because the whole next one is about just about the collaboration. And any last words you want Did to Did I give it right. to you? Because I don't know. Well, I, you know, so let's stop. Okay, we'll stop. Let's stop, stop. And doing that kind of thing. So uh, that was a part of my interest in music and sound, which was also part of the performances that I made, which also went along with this digital computer piece that I did called Dream City, uh, which was very early work that sort of uh, pronounced and introduced uh, working with uh, software where you could draw and make images. Well, anyway. One last question. Yes. Was the collaboration, I mean, you guys kept talking about, you know, nobody's writing about us, they're writing about us raw, or, you know, was collaboration for you, was it a way for you all to actually get on the map, to get her, to get your work out there? Was that, that was quote unquote, unquote, only ways that you could actually? Well, that was one of the ways, because in a sense, since you've heard all of our different careers, we were getting some attention in different arenas. And so by collaborating, we could pull each other's arena towards the total group, OK? And that's kind of how we, that was another part of our strategies. Well, not only that, but it was exciting to work together yes. and to expand mm -hmm. our, our own ideas. personal concepts. And, yeah, and, I think and there was a big collaboration that went on in Ulysses' other vision studio right. on Vermont near Jefferson with Rudy Perez. Right. And we would come over every Monday evening, I think it was, and we would, uh, you know, warm up. Rudy is a, is a dancer and had a company here in Los Angeles, and he would come over and we would warm up and then we would do stuff. And we, we, take, we take the exercises out of uh, Rudy's class and then we end up in performances, and that's where, that's where some of the, act, the activities that ended up in Doctor Interpretation came out of Rudy's. Right. But other and uh, other, other people were with us, like May's son, and Chrono, right. and, and oh, Ben Sulo. Ben Sulo. Sulo. Oh, that's what I could remember. Chrono, yeah. yes. Yes, who also is, is deceased. And Ben yeah. Sulo? Mm -hmm. Now, other visions, it was a way for what to happen? Why did you create other visions? Well, for the most part, other visions what was it? It essentially was created to help, help uh, myself, of course, and other artists of color to produce work. Um, and we didn't have a studio per se as other people in other ethnic communities had and or something where we could do what we called our own style of contemporary art. And that's what other visions uh, really serviced us all to have the opportunity to do. Um, I would say this, you can look at this while I'm gone, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll get it tomorrow, but maybe that maybe you might want to play it tomorrow night. I'm giving okay. it as a presence for David. Okay. Okay. And we'll start with you tomorrow night. Oh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> We're talking about collaboration. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that would be the way. That's yeah. the way it's gonna go. All okay. right. Thank you. And uh, you're so gonna bring those images with them. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll bring them. All right. Sorry. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. What about tomorrow? Ulysses. Yeah. What about tomorrow? Uh, do you have you know, my cell phone number? Try this number down and call me. 
Okay, she got it. All right, thanks. Okay, um, now we're going to show some examples of what we think is of support, then singularly we would have just faded. So that's why, you know, this tape is so important to me because that's why I said it's the emotional aspect of our collaborations. Oh yeah! Uh, we we'll have another thing to do. Resurrection. <laughs> So I'm thinking the whole time that that was the experience. No, he's describing the experience. But I, there's an actual book about these this tribe. They still do it today. Who is it? The Khoisan people? No, South Africa. South Africa. The Bushmen. Bushmen. Yeah. Okay. And um, in fact, Yo-Yo Ma did something with them mm. as well, but it's not as effective as this. Because this is the pure thing, and to me. That is how deep our relationships, you know, run. Do you agree? I need a copy. Do you agree? Don't go far. Only in the dance do the two come together. 
and they come together this way, they're in a set in a circle or a little group, and uh, they then become the center around which the men dance. And they control the dance and what goes on with the men through their own singing and beating of the thighs. What's the significance of that as a woman is controlling the dance? Well, the woman is life, and the man is the servant of life. And, uh, and during the course of this circling, circling is a very tense style of movement the men have. Uh, it's funny that one of them will pass out. He's in trance now. And this is a description of an experience. When people sing, I dance. I enter the earth. I go in at a place like a place where people drink water. I travel a long way, very far. When I emerge, I'm already climbing. I'm climbing threads. I climb one and leave it. Then I climb another one, then I leave it. And I climb another. When you arrive at God's place, you make yourself small. You come in small to God's place. You do what you have to do there. Then you return to where everyone is. You come and come and come, and finally you enter your body again. All the people who have stayed behind are waiting for you. They fear you. You enter, enter the earth, and you return to enter the skin of your body, and you stay. That is the sound of your return to your body. Then you begin to sing. The two masters are there around. They take hold of your head and blow about the sides of your face. This is how you manage to be alive again. Friends, if they don't do that to you, you die. You just die and are dead. Friends, this is what it does, this tum that I do, this tum here that I dead. Oh, certainly. I mean, the thing about that, and when you're comparing it with our uh, collaborations, I mean, there are things that obviously we can't even express that happen during a lot of the work that we perform together. Um, certainly in, uh, in Dream City, there was a sense of that similar kind of thing. Um, and then again, uh, I think in that flying piece that I was talking about earlier, uh, there was that sense of, of, of that kind of connectedness. But the thing, you know, I was listening to him when he was talking about going out of his body and everything. So I went to, I went to uh, Brazil last summer, mm -hmm. and I went to the Condomble houses, mm -hmm. and, this, and where the sisters go out and, 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 are, and are taken over uh, uh, by the spirit or by the Orisha spirits. And uh, I see this, this very similar kind of connection to of reaching a higher plane within our existence on this on this earth uh, in African cultures and so that's the thing that when we're talking about collaborations that I don't think most writers were able to comprehend when we did work together uh, I would say even that piece that I seen that you guys did with Frank that kissing piece oh, yeah. okay oh, that was funny. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a piece that, so when I first saw it on video, I just thought, man, I wish I was in that piece. Because the fact of the matter that you had, and this goes back to this whole thing about, you know, stereotypes about black folks, but see, for the most part, uh, this particular culture, uh, and, 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 and I would say American culture per se, or, or Western cultures, don't give us credit enough that we could extend that type of gesture and feeling towards others, uh, you know, in, in let's say a certain kind of communal setting. Mm -hmm. So when is the last time you ever saw, you know, African Americans coming to you and offering you a kiss and an embrace freely without some kind of negativity attached to the gesture or some kind of pornographic kind of idea that you're supposed to get something off of it? Um, it's, it's those kinds of, and that's the thing, that's, that's why I wanted to work with these women, because they will come up with the kind of ideas that not only were they fresh, but they were heartfelt. And, they, you know, again, it was something that you, you didn't expect 
from African Americans as an aesthetic and creative gesture. So that looking at that, and of course seeing that, that whole idea of holding and embracing the individual to bring them back into this world uh, is, is, is very, uh, how do you say it? Uh, it's otherworldly, it's sunrise. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's all the things that are pretty much misunderstood about how Africans see this life on this planet. And it's also not only holding, caressing the person as they come back, but it's allowing that person to go out there. Right. Mm -hmm. And as a shaman, you know, you're taking the responsibility of going further out than anybody else. And you're also taking the responsibility of coming back in and somehow interpreting that information right. so that the community is able to somehow use it in some way, you know, be nourished by it. That's, go ahead. What, uh, why the emphasis on ritual? There's so much emphasis on ritual um, particularly in you three, in the American chime and me too or me not, but you know, the, is collab one, two questions, is collaboration linked with ritual and why ritual? What, what is the compelling thing about ritual? It, it all had to do about recognizing the spiritual sense for me anyway yes. without uh, being associated with organized religion. And for me, because of the fact that I had this strong Catholic background, you know, not only mine but my parents and my um, you know, just a whole family of people, and I no longer could see how basically that was an avenue of, of uh, you know, spiritual expression for me. So it's like creating another uh, space for myself to have, you know, a spiritual connection, you know, and as pure and as simple. I mean, it was really pure and very simple, you know, um, not necessarily, you know, knowing or understanding at all times what this was, other than I felt that I had to do it. Or and I had to like you know recognize it in other people um, because it just seemed like as a religious I could not grasp you know religious practices as you know I knew them anymore and I never saw that you know churches out there could give me what I needed in terms of you know spiritual fulfillment so you know if you go back to your own you know you have to go back inside and basically this is the way I saw it and and sorting it out for yourself and ritual was. An, to me, the most obvious way to do it because of the background. You know, Catholicism as it's practiced today is not the way it was when I was growing up. It was the Latin Mass, okay? It was a lot of incense, it was the, you know, the high mass, it was all of that stuff that was cloaked in a certain amount of mystery, you know? And I guess, personally, I wanted to like, um, just separate the mystery of it out and have a more direct connect with the spiritual source. I mean, you keep going back to, you know, we have the Rio Trilogy. Right. Um, I think in, in so many works, even up to Planet X, there's this figure, there's this mystical figure, uh, Egyptian uh, imagery. Mm -hmm. I mean, how does that work for you? I mean, you know, we know Barbara was talking about, you know, Catholic background, um, but how does that work for you and how does that connect with those? Well, see what like the, the story I was telling about when I was in grad school and I was being told number one, okay, you're not gonna be able to be a successful artist uh, um, because you're you're trying to do something that's not based on the Eurocentric canon, and that really stuck with me because I said to myself, there's got to be a way that I could speak in an aesthetic point of view that comes number one from an African point of view, and then uh, something that I can uh, you know utilize for myself. And so in terms of that, uh, ritual, again, uh, as Barbara talked about her, her uh, conversations with Betty Saar, I mean, Betty Saar was teaching at Otis when I went there as well, and I was very much in, in, impacted by the ritual relationships that she imbued in her work. And of course, listening to her lectures about her work and realizing and coming to realize that there is a particular way in which you as, as, as an African American can enjoin yourself to the ancestral, um, let's say, mythos if you understand where that's coming from and how it fits with you. And so that's been, that's been my quest, that's been my search, actually. 
to find that and for myself, basically. And I and so what happened since I since I was doing performance, I changed dramatically after doing, uh, like I said, doing performance uh, in terms of like two zone and a narrative sort of occidental context, and changed over to this ritual context, which was what Adams B. Dargo was about. The, the, the Oriental versus the uh, Occidental. The, the, the fact that a theater in the round was a community uh, sort of particip participation, and that when you'd had that kind of communication going on, it wasn't just that sort of hierarchical kind of proscenium line that's drawn where we on the stage are the authorities, you out there just listen. So I, I went that way, and then of course engaging with the music, where music becomes more of a central device, which is what the griots do. Griot comes to town, they tell the story of the village. They tell the stories of the family. They, they, they show up at the funerals. They, sh you know, they show up at the weddings. And to whatever degree that a lot of people don't understand that that practice has a lot to do with the music industry. Because that's what you have with, uh, with African Americans taking over the music industry to whatever degree they control it. That's what you're getting. The griot comes to town. Griot tells the stories. Griot plays the music of, because each, what you have in terms of those griots, the melodies that they're playing, a lot of times, are dedicated to families. These are the musics of the family. That's what King Sonny Ade is all about. And when he comes to town, he's playing you, the, that juju music is about that, in terms of what that family is trying to say. Uh, so anyway, I tried to incorporate those thoughts into the making of the work as a way of saying, as a contemporary African-American artist, we come to town, we come to tell you our stories, and that's why it goes back to and sort of relates. And it, you see, when I found that link with the grill, then I could continue telling stories as I was doing earlier, just as a documentarian. And then, as an artist, I can fictionalize to whatever degree, but I could also conceptualize and pull from different things. So that's why when I saw Barbara's work, I was like, oh my god, and, you know, this has a whole lot to do with what I had intentions on doing, but also her artistry influenced me in terms of, because I hadn't seen a whole lot of special effects stuff that she was capable of doing. And I'm telling you, when I saw those women squatting down and pissing on the ground, I said, shit, that's it, man. <laughs> That's some power right there. And it still has the power. Right. It's amazing. Well, you know, one thing I think this is it, I think, you know, I, I want to, you know, touch on again is basically the whole idea of touching our ancestral past. I mean, that was really important to me because I felt like, you know, you're part of the society, but yet you're not, you know, and because you have other instincts or other things that basically pull you away from the society and the society at the same time does not respect those things and those things need to be honored and brought out and shared with other people, you know, so that you are bringing, you know, um, bringing something down to your community, but, you know, beyond your community to understand, you know, how as African Americans you're part of this situation, but you're actually not part of it, you know. And it's and part of, and, and, and at the same time, while you're not giving the respect, it's okay to be not necessarily a part of this society because you have other things to bring to the table to share with those of like, you know, like you. And it was about sharing with those who are like me. You know? And if other people could embrace that, then that was okay too. You know? But it was really about touching that ancestral past and bringing, bringing forth you know, uh, you know, the beauty and the, the qualities of that that basically have helped us to survive for centuries. You know? and, and what is the role that black nationalism plays in this? You know, in terms of you know, um, our ancestors, our community, you know, it's, I don't want to say it's closed, I don't want to read it as negative, but in terms of what black nationalism or cultural nationalism, the program that that was putting out, which was about the ancestral, about mm -hmm. Africa, about the roots of African Americans, and, you know, you know, Maulana Karinga, and us, and the Panthers, they were all up here in California, I mean, obviously the Panthers in Northern California, but Mala Karina, here, 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 here. right, and, and in Baltimore, right. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about in a in an LA context, in terms of how nationalism really 
inflects this kind of thought? I mean, is it an influence? Is you, that, that I would say for me it, it was in, in the sense that, see, the thing that you have to recognize, the artwork in, in a, a whole other way of looking at it is political. Even though sometimes it's not viewed as that. It's not, yeah, it's not. And, it's and, not, yeah, not viewed as that. Right. And, and, and that, and the politics, the thing, I'll come back to it again. The politics that's in it is us being ourselves. Mm -hmm. You see, because when I was, when I, again, when I was at Otis, I was, you know, sitting there showing these videos to uh, some grad students, and I had one thing that, it was, you know, when you have these review of your work and these, uh, certain kind of crits. And I had, a, I had a video where it was, I think it was just me, just just a picture of me on the screen. And everybody breaks out into this laughter and stuff. And I'm like, what's so funny? I didn't tell a joke. Is it just the, the issue of the black image itself standing alone? It's supposed, I mean, I wasn't doing step and fetch it, but for somehow they were getting that kind of tickle. And I'm saying, where does this come from? So if the read of the singular African American image is supposed to be comedic for its own sake, or has it been stereotyped to the sake of saying that, okay, I see this brother and now I laugh? Okay? That's daunting. Well, that's, that's the experience that I had, and I think in some cases you still have that notion based upon the fact that the misunderstanding of the black image is where I started at in the first place. How do I get people to re-examine uh, re why they have the ridiculous notions that they have about us when there's no different than when, the, when either one of us would to walk up on either in a gallery or show images of ourselves in a gallery that they should be comedic or they should be this this some kind of way of looking at threatening yeah the threatening stuff and all that other thing I mean I'm not gonna deny that we're humorous okay I mean I think we're heck of humorous but you know there's a there's there's where do we get the respect if you can go there about that we're serious. So that's when you say, well, why didn't anybody write anything? Well, the only thing they know how to write is like, see Dick Run and see, see Spot and you know, do this and that. So for you, the nationalism comes in in the sense of um, validating the idea that, it, that you can have in your work as an artist a program that is about reversing all of this stuff and presenting yourself, and that's not entertainment, that's something serious. Right, it's something to be taken serious, but I think when you say the 10-point plan mm -hmm. is a part, for me, of what I felt we needed to institute in a way that's revolutionary. I mean, the fact of the matter that the revolution did come right there in your face, then that was shocking for black folks. So at the same time, how do you get us to enjoy in our own revolution that we should be to this day about in terms of recognizing that we are some very intelligent individuals living on this planet? I mean, when you look at a video like that and you just go, wow, man, they was thinking that. Well, you know, the people who observed them when they came to colonize said, look at that silly little children. But the other thing that I'm thinking about, too, is that at this time, 70s, late 60s and 70s, um, in Los Angeles, again, it seems like what's dominant is the nationalist version of the revolution. And in that version, in the visual arts, um, you know, it's making positive imagery, um, representational art, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, none of you is doing exactly that. You know, you're, you're taking on the agenda, but you're choosing some very different means. And I'm wondering about you know, what, where that puts you, in a sense. 
It, no well, aware. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because we, we didn't consider we were part of the agenda. I mean, basically, okay. you know, that's really what it was. Mm -hmm. Because I just felt like, you know, this is something that I really had to do. This was a part of, you know, what I saw that I felt as though was needed. And my whole perspective was, if I have an idea I want to put across, and maybe I'm only going to touch one person, mm -hmm. then, it, you know, or maybe two people, but it needs to be put out there because maybe that one person will share with another person. And it was not, I mean, it was not part of a conscious, you know, political uh, statement, you know. It was about, this is where I see we are, this is where I see I am as an African American person, specifically, specifically an African American woman, and I want to share these ideas with other people, okay, so that, you know, I am very sure that anyone who was, I call a strictly doctrinaire person, would look at my work and go like, what the hell is this? This is pornography. This is soft porn. And I have gotten that you know, from people. And they couldn't understand what I wanted to do, what, what I was doing. And it basically was because I had experienced someone who had gone through a, you know, a nervous breakdown who went back and regressed to a very primal kind of activity. And that activity basically was, you know, they put themselves in a circle. You know, they, you know, they created this space, this safe space for themselves. And it's like this circular continuity. You know, and at the same time they were, you know, they were pacing and marching, and everything they did was, you know, repetitive. Every single thing that they did was repetitive. You know, and then that person squatted down and peed. You know, and she felt better. <laughs> you know, but at the same time it was taking what I had observed from a very dear friend who had gone through a breakdown, and somebody had called me on the phone because I didn't know what was happening, and like. <clears throat> I got this call from Kamal Daoud who asked me could I come over and help because you know this person was going through this and she was a very beloved member of the community. She was a dancer and what have you and she was having this very this breakdown and you know no one knew how to help her but they did not want to institutionalize her. You know they wanted to basically you know um, you know see what we could do as friends to help her to really heal through this, this trauma that she was experiencing. And it made me really look at what she was doing. And you know, that and the work that I was seeing too, you know, it said something to me going back to what is this that made her go back to this very to do these things that are very primal to me, but at the same time they were helping her get through what she was experiencing. You know. And that was, you know, so like I said, I don't think, you know, it was it was never an overt political message that I was trying to get across, but I was trying to understand something that I had observed and at the same time look at their work and see how there was this repetition of symbols and signs. There was these, there were these activities that they were doing, basically that wound up, you know, making me reflect back on this experience that this person was having as she was going through, you know, this maybe it was not maybe it was more than a breakdown, maybe it was a breakthrough. I've never been able to actually, you know, kinda like totally understand it. But, you know, it was something that I had never seen before, I had never experienced before. You know, when I was there, I was like totally shocked about, you know, in terms of what she was going through. But everybody there was there to help her, and, and like it was a community thing to help her bridge, you know, this thing that she was going through to get back to some sense of normalcy. You know, and that's really, I think, what I was, I was interested in. You know, how did these experiences with the ritual, with repetitive activity, with spiritual motivated work, bring you to a state of normalcy as opposed to chaos? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, that's, that's really good, that the yes. chaos thing. Because for me personally, um, you know, the work has spiritual content for me, but um, the repetition is a way of calming down. So. I just use it all the time. It's a it's a building block and it's a cognitive. It's like um, worry beads. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. oh, sorry, okay. I was just going to say um, the uh, ritual aspect is, of course, you know, strongly spiritual for me. But uh, ritual also usually kind of there's movement related to ritual, mm -hmm. and also. I, I like to find commonalities with things, and ritual really controls all of our lives, all of our lives. You can even think of racism as ritual, because you're, no, really, you're, no, no, I mean, yeah, 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 you're doing something in a certain way 
you know, to get certain results because with a ritual you're, you know, you're doing things and you expect a certain result from uh, doing it in a very, very specific way, very specific way, because it had, the more specific it is, the better the outcome. And in that way, you could look at racism that way. You can, I mean, our whole, there's not one human being on this planet that doesn't go through their whole, whole their own rituals. Yeah, because, everybody engages in rituals. Yeah, because you, it is satisfying. It is um, grounding, in a sense. It's a way of... Um, <coughs> control, too. Control. It's about mm -hmm. control. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's rituals and there's rituals. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I've seen artists do ritualized performances, and I really felt they were cliché and boring. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't tell me anything about anything. And then during that time, uh, related to what was going on uh, in, in the majority culture and the white culture, I think there was a difference in that most of our stuff was kind and, you know, K-I-N-D, <laughs> is that what you said? Yeah, kind, and um, almost loving, where we should have maybe been doing the thing that some of the white performance artists were doing, like, um, that's his face, uh, shooting himself, and Chris, Chris, Burton. Burton. Chris Burton, and then the guy that, you know, took the hooks, you oh, know, and hung. No. Why? I hung him. You know I hung him. No. Yeah. Stop. When he came in LA, Rachel called me, he says, I got this guy who needs to have these hooks put in his body, and nobody no. do it. We used to outdo it. And I said, no, I said, I said, if he's crazy enough to want the hooks, I'll do it. Of course, and this was just before HIV and everything was was out there, so I didn't, I, you know. But you know, I went there and he showed me how he needed it done. And so, I, so he laid down on the ground. And, you know, you just take a pull up some, some skin, right? Where there's no, where there's, where there's, where there's no muscle, and you just go. Oh my god! And I hooked him up, and then we, <laughs> and then we pulled him up, okay, over the top of the gallery. And I did it two times. We did it once in her space. I don't think you guys remember that old railroad station in Culver City that yes. was on Venice? And he hung. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And we hung him in there. <laughs> before, before they remodeled the place, there was nothing but debris. Right. So if he had fallen, uh, you know, because you know, the whole thing is if you don't go deep enough, that stuff was hooks oh. will, those hooks will rip out your body. Oh my God. And see, that was the weird That's thing nasty. that we had that we had reason to you know, like mutilate ourselves or whatever, or, or do <laughs> anger, anger, angry kinds of things, but we didn't do it. Uh, a lot of our stuff was about nurturing and, you know, providing, you know, something good. But then on the other side of that, there were certain artists that were really, you know, I guess, you know, they would call them edgy in a sense, but still it wasn't uh, giving, right. even forgiving. Right. It was, uh, you know, something else. So I thought that was, I always thought during that time that was very interesting, you know, um, with the difference between black performances and... Well, I think that too has something to do with um, yeah. the spiritual connotation. See, the thing is, the thing is, the, under, the underpinnings, like, of that work was a spirituality, and that's why I will mention now Matthew Thomas. Mm -hmm. Because when I started collaborating with Matthew, who's who's been studying to be a Buddhist monk, we started introducing these sand paintings in the works. So we did one. I think he did. It wasn't a sand painting, but he did do a, a structural kind of uh, a motif in that performance we did at the Branches show when we did that sound piece. And so um, that, in its own right, actually, me and Matthew talked about the use of these sand, these sand paintings and that number one, we were not trying to mimic any type of exact uh, sand painting that would be done by a Buddhist, but we would at least on a certain level give the appearance of and use the aesthetics of, which he is also a painter, colors, uh, form, and those kind of things in those sand paintings to function on a similar kind of plane. In other words, we would import our own notion of spirituality and practice in those paintings. Well, I think that you know the difference between the performances that you guys are describing and the, like the Chris Burden and the Crook and the Stan right. kind of performances right. is that those have a 
very negative spiritual content. They, have a, they describe a very negative, nihilistic, um, sadistic, masochistic um, point of view. With you to talk to Stella, I keep telling you he got the idea from watching these Native, Native Americans. Native Americans, right? Mm -hmm. There's a Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Sign ceremony, right? Right, right. But, are, but did they but hang themselves from the same place? place. No, no, it's not coming from the same place. place. I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't think of them as hanging themselves up for a public display. Did no. they do that? Well, they hung well, they, themselves yeah. up, but it was right. far out. It was to yeah. transcend a certain right. exactly. kind of. Uh, Accent in terms of with experiences that they were having in their life, or like it was, it was or something, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, like right. Like, so it was like a cleansing, it was like right. a right. cleansing moment, right. Right. right? right. Well, it doesn't sound like what he was doing was cleansing. <laughs> no, maybe it was. I mean, don't you think that that white people at that moment are cleansing themselves? The young people of your generation, if you're looking, these are people of your generation, mm -hmm. and so on. Right. They're cleansing themselves from what their parents had done by doing these violent things. I mean, if you think about Chris Burden's work, it seems like what he says about it is he's really putting his white male body to a certain extent in harm's way to prove, to show it as a white male body in harm's way. And the reason why black people don't do this is because, you, like you said, you walk down the street every other day, you in harm's way. So why are you going to do that? That's old. That's not even a performance. Well, see, that's, that's life. And that's what most of these, these writers or these so-called critics don't Get. They figure, well, you know, you're not challenging yourself. You're not trying to get killed. I say, I almost get killed every day. <laughs> Shit. I mean, I almost got killed just going to school in the South. I mean, the, the, if I want to get killed, that's not hard to do. Matter of fact, black on black crime is a regular thing. But And I think it's also uh, the same situation with the feminist movement. You know, black women have always had to work. So it wasn't an issue, you know, this wasn't this contrived issue of, well, it's not contrived, but that, uh, you know, we need to get out there and be equal, you know, on the job market and everything because women have always had, black women have always had that some level of independence when it's come to that. So it wasn't... Forced and forced. And forced, forced. Exactly. It's like being, you know, you know, I can... Well, let's put it this way. The, the, the statistics about black men in jail is, is, you know, they're trying to get him out of jail now. And uh, Schwarzenegger yesterday talking about he's going to let him out because they need some money. So it's, you know, this whole, again, a lot of the, the strategies, and I'll leave it at that, you know, in terms of the work that we were trying to produce, in a lot of ways went beyond the expectations. On, I think that, first and foremost, went beyond the expectations of what a lot of people thought that we could think let's put it that way, but then at the same time, what we were thinking was not what they succinctly thought we should be thinking. And so having their, let's say, notion of, of, of putting a position on us has always been the struggle, I think, of an African-American artist in this culture. But I'm also thinking, um, what I'm, the other thing that I feel like I'm hearing here is the extent to which your work was not other directed. Your work was directed at your centers, however you saw them. From the and, center out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Center out. Um, it, didn't, and, it didn't really, I mean, that's quite true. It was very personal work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and that you didn't necessarily feel your obligation you know, was to make certain kinds of statements um, to the world, not that, not, I, I, I'm not putting it. No, but the I, obligation yeah. was to, to, to basically convey the truth, to convey your truths. Okay. That's really yeah, what it okay. was. Okay. The obligation was to convey your truths, mm -hmm. not to plug in on anything, but to convey your truths as you saw them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and you experience them and felt right. them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you didn't have to, as far as I was concerned, I didn't have to state in certain terms that I was a black woman and I was because I've had pretty much every experience, you know, I don't even want to talk about the experiences I've had, really. Um, and so whatever I do, even if it's abstract, is coming from these experiences. You know, it's coming from some really funky 
experiences. So um, I don't have to explain it, I don't have to put it in a certain framework so people will easily identify it. If it's coming from me and I'm black and I, you know, I've had these various experiences that are really black experiences, I don't, you know, then that's it. That's what it is. Can we move to Marin? Um, because I want to ask this. I mean, you brought up the question about nationalism and, you know, this ancestral thing. But Marin has said, you know, you know, her work never looked this way, you know. Um, and that even though it never seemed to be more quote unquote identity based, uh, yet and still most of the shows you were in. In other words, who supported your work were black people and women to a certain extent, or you were in the women's show, or you were in the black shows. But I wonder how your aesthetic then, uh, you know, relates to you know this whole nationalist thing, um, and also how the collaboration then works because you're still collaborating with people who are supposedly looking more ancestral in a certain way that could relate to Africa. So I'm wondering how you see yourself, one, in terms of relating to nationalism, in terms of relating to Africa, and then in terms of how that works with the collaboration. Um, well, I made this piece um, recently. It's still going on. It's been going on for 15 years. Um, it's at 110th Street and the IRT. It's in the IRT. And it's called Message from Malcolm. Mm -hmm. And um, it has all these uh, little symbols on it, which I discovered all of this work that I had been doing with wire rope, like uh, you know, weaving the ends together and unplying the ends and fraying them out, and you know, having two unfrayed ends joined by a length of wire rope. If you can imagine that, right? Mm -hmm. I happened to look in one of Robert Ferris Thompson's books, and I saw all of those symbols way after I had made all the, the wire rope pieces. And it was, um, it was uh, it, um, images of, uh, let's see, what's the word I used, but of in, uh, empowerment. Oh, oh, that's right. They were, they were uh, images of empowerment. Was it in Flash of the yeah. Spirit? Uh, yeah. And um, so then I, I was like very uh, taken aback because I had never studied that book before. I made those images. Um, so all I can say is it's like the ancestral thing is there and I'm not, um, I'm just going with the flow, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, as far as working together, I mean, it's lonely just being in your studio all the time and Sangha and Ulysses were great fun and great friends and great support system and for me. Partner and uh, Parker, right. and um, you know some of the women that were in my dance class together, and it was wonderful, the photographs that um, Barbara took, and her participation um, you know, uh, with uh, Frank and you, and the performances, and um, my relationship to them is that we're friends. I really think that we're friends, and we've been through a lot together. We've been through 30 or 40 years of making work together, and we're all in our 60s now. Baby boomers. <laughs> And we didn't have a support in the system, yeah. and we supported mm -hmm. one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's really important um, and, uh, to recognize. Uh, and I want to mention this issue about music. And I have some materials that Craig gave me, and part of it was talking about you know um, improvisation, and he went really back to bop, bebop and all that kind of stuff. But um, you know, we've always kind of looked up as to jazz, I've always kind of looked up to jazz musicians as being, you know, um, you know, it's like in African culture, you know, they they set the tone, you know, with with drums. Um, you don't know uh, what um, Orisha you're working with until the drummer tells you, okay, this is what's happening. 
And so with jazz, you know, this, this intense improvisation um, was, you know, really exhilarating and it, and it um, exemplifies African American culture, this issue of improvisation. That's why I mentioned the performance with Marin, you know, immediately being able to come up with this and everybody kind of chiming along, almost like a, uh, what's it, something in response, um, call, 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 call response. And then, um, it, you know, I could always call on Barbara. If she was at home, I would say, Barbara, I'm on Pico, I'm on Arlington. They're tearing down this building. That's when I did Rapunzel. They're tearing down this <laughs> building. Uh, oh can you God. come and, you know, take the, take the photographs, <laughs> tape it, whatever you need to do. So as they're tearing down the building, she and I, I'm posing and she's shooting and they're literally tearing down the building behind us. And that's improvisation. That's being in the yes. moment. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we were able to do that with each other. If the moment was right, we could call on each other in an instant and work out this concept and go with the concept. And then the concept evolved as we were, you know, in the moment. You know, it's kind of interesting. This was like post-1990, but I was thinking of what you did in, in um, Copenhagen with the oh, right. Museum. That was, to me, really... That so where was that? Okay, this thing was a part of the show mm -hmm. and at the Louisiana Museum in and Copenhagen. How, yeah, Howard Dino was in that show yeah. too. And it was a show of, of women's work from the Southern right. era. Right. And now it was so here. here. Now here. Here. Now here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because I have been to a few, a couple of performances where there was nobody there but me and Sanga. But it was a performance that Sanga had to do, and it was really interesting because. Um, it was me taking her, doing this performance on the side of a, of a path, okay, and you could see Sweden, I think, on the other side, you know. Was it, I think it was Denmark. We were in Denmark, but oh. I think, but Sweden, you could oh. see, it was near, oh, yeah. okay. you could see Sweden on the other side, I think. I mean, it was near, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can't remember all of it, but anyway, basically, there was a body of water there, and there was a piece of land on the other side of the body of water. And you know the Louisiana Museum was really in a very nice area because you know you had wooded area around it, and she was on this path, and she was like performing this ceremonial um, uh, ritual, and it was only me and, and the two of us, okay. And then another time when she was in Colorado Springs, I'd gone to visit her, and at that time it was three because it was a it was at a a place where a friend of yours had like a bed and breakfast or something, and you had done. You had done something outside. And it was so interesting to me because, you know, Senga's creative spirit must survive. It has to have an outlet. And it doesn't matter whether or not, you know, um, there is a group of 10 people, you know, a thousand people, whatever. It's like it had to come out. And that was one thing that I've always respected her for because it's like she's going to do it regardless of. Who, you know where the audience is because she has to do it. I mean, there is the thrust there to do this, and it was really interesting. You know how it was just me with a Super 8 camera mm -hmm. that I had dragged, you know, on the plane from you know from L.A. to document whatever was going on. And also, you had done that the installation there at the uh, Louisiana Museum too. Right. You know, and so I just it was like an extension of my wanting to document what it was that she was doing. You know, because I just felt like her work was really important. And she had this incredible spirit to get, you know, the need to get her work out. And I felt as though it needed to be documented in the way I could. And it was like, you know, also, you know, I wanted to go back to you were talking about collaborations. And, you know, like Studio Z was really kind of an interesting, you know, experience. Because I was more on the periphery of, of it. Um, but music came out of that experience. I mean, music was part of how it all started, actually. You know, because the art ensemble came to LA and they didn't have really a, a place to perform in some kind of way. I think Al Ryan who was a patron of the arts. I mean, there were, there were people in LA who were patron of the arts. And they were African American and they bought David's work, they bought Don Can Don, um, Dan Consular's work. 
they bought um, they bought work with people, and there was there was a group of artists who were established as artists, but they had no outlet and there was no recognition, and that's why House of Music got you know to be. But it was so interesting, and I know Sanger was a part of that experience. I know that Marin had done you know uh, was somewhat associated with it, and I know there was a show at Long Beach where you know, people from you know that you know, that group had done and. I mean, not only think it survived for a couple of years, but at the same time, it was all the same things that Ulysses said in terms of why, you know, they, you know, why he needed to do other visions. It was the same thing. It was need to get the, you know, the work out there, and the only way they felt as though they could do it was together. Okay, and that was the way in which, you know, you know it was Joe Ray and Ro and, you know, and, and and was it Greg Edwards? And you know, just you know, some really interesting people. But I was like sort of on the periphery of that. But what I gained from that was a relationship with Sanger, you know, because you know I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, who I was, and as a creative person. And these people had already sort of like identified what they were doing, you know, and basically were they had exhibited, but still they were not getting the recognition. And they did things to Studio Z, and they still didn't get the recognition, you know. And it was really. It was it was an exciting exciting period too because when you had people I mean you know you had the art ensemble coming through there you had uh, Duck Carn you had you know other people who came through there and it was really interesting because I think it was like David's space and David left and then he gave the key to Robo and basically you know he got together with other people because that that place was actually incorporated as a as California State uh, corporate entity. And in fact, my mother was on the board of directors, and Al Ryan was on the board of directors, and my mother's husband at the time was, was even on the board of directors. And it, and basically, it was they needed some names, <laughs> and you know, and Deval Lewis was, you know, he was involved in doing, you know, things or promoting <laughs> them to do things. And so it was really kind of interesting to see what was going on. But like I said, I was more on the periphery; got a chance to observe what was going on and I got the benefit of that because you know for example when I was at UCLA I had a, the opportunity to bring my camera class somewhere and so what we were going to do is basically shoot things in Studio Z with Joe Ray had these incredibly huge uh, pieces that were acrylic planets and those acrylic planets I mean I don't, you know, I don't know how he, he did them how he fabricated them but they were huge and they were like you know planets and he had basically had them uh, colored the way you know you see these uh, NASA photographs of the different planets, and I, uh, you know, I shot a sequence there with Sharon uh, Lee Larkin, and it was it was really really great. So that kind of like provided a somewhat of an outlet uh, for me to in a very limited way, but at the same time, what I gained from that was uh, the experience of seeing other African American artists who were doing their work. And you know, I felt like I basically I could have my voice. You know, I could have my voice. And even you know, I can remember even there was a thing with Cheryl with, with your studio with Cheryl Banks, who's a dancer. Right. And, 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 and Roberta Miranda. Right, 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 I mean, right. You know, so there was like a, there was there was like a lot of collaboration going on, and, and sometimes in a very um, casual way, but sometimes in a very right. organized way. You know, and those you know, for example, you know, with that collaboration with Cheryl, 